What's going on Wayward Power Sports gang? Thank you for checking in on today's video. We've got something pretty cool for all my weekend warriors, newcomers, thank you for checking out the channel. I wanna show you guys today what we're gonna be working on. We're gonna be replacing a piston in a 2004 Honda Sierra 250. Now, I actually owned an 04 450, and that was a great bike, but we're gonna be going through proper tips and procedures when it comes to replacing the piston on your engine. So, we're gonna be going through do's and don'ts, and let's get right into it. So when do you know when you need a top end rebuild? Well, it's hard to say. Sometimes it'll be an obvious indication like the engine blowing up or it'll be something a little bit less indicative of you needing a top end rebuild. And you might require special tools like a compression test or a leak down tester to be able to actually tell if you will need a new piston, a valve job, something like that. Um, and we do all that kind of stuff here at Wayward Power Sports. Um, compression and leak down tests and we can tell if your engine is in healthy condition and if not well we have the means and tools to be able to fix it so this Honda was brought to me uh, needing a valve adjustment uh, he brought it in and we do charge about 140 bucks for a valve adjustment um, so we brought it in and we found out here, let me show you guys so here's what we found guys in the exhaust side we had a 2.5 and a 2.41 millimeter shim which is just fine take a look at the intake a 155 and a 15. Now with that math, I would need to throw in a 1.506 and a 1.38 millimeter. <laughs> now I don't know if you guys are aware or not, uh, some of you may or may not be, but a 1.38 shim is small. That is a small, tiny little shim. Now at that point, what that's telling me is that the valves are getting so worn and they're creeping up into the head. And what that's doing is causing the valve stem to sit higher than it normally would and shrink down that valve clearance to almost nothing. So now you gotta throw in a 1.38 shim. That is very small. My kit goes from 3.5, goes from a 3.5 to a 1.2. I don't think there's any circumstance on the planet that would make me run a 1.2 millimeter shim in this engine or any other engine for that matter. At that point, you're risking the thin shim sliding out, changing your valve clearance, hanging up a valve or causing the, the valve to bend actually. And it's not a good situation. So after taking a look at the head, we were able to see that the valve seats were shot, worn down. So the head is actually sent out now to get head work done, uh, replacing the seats and having them recut. And then we're gonna set it up with new valves and a spring kit, and that head is gonna be all set to go. So that's for a separate video. I'll do something like that. But we're gonna be taking a look at the cylinder today. We're gonna to start with the components and the measuring and things you need to take a look out for when doing stuff like this. So let's get right into it and show you guys exactly what I do to replace a piston in an engine. So here's all our components. Got a new timing chain, wrist pin, circlips, and rings. That's a good idea to always replace that cam chain when you do a top end just because they tend to get worn and they can actually get so worn that your timing can skip and it's just not a good situation. So I always recommend anytime you do a top end just throw a new cam chain in there. It's not a big deal. So after realizing that it needed major head repair um, I took a look at the piston and it's always a good idea just to go ahead and replace the piston for the 150 bucks it costs to do it. You might as well just do it. These things should be replaced about every 20 hours um, for hard racers and things like that. Um, but this piston was shot guys, take a look at it right now. Um, massive blow by, wearing on the piston skirts and you can just tell that needed major replacement. Also taking a look at the cylinder, it doesn't look too bad. Um, there's cross hatching on it, which is a good sign. Um, however, there is a little bit of what looks like to be a nick in the cylinder, in the nickasil. Um, but running a fingernail over it, it doesn't catch. So we're gonna go ahead and just hone the cylinder, uh, deglaze it and recross hatch it. And uh, we should be all good to go so that those new rings will seat better um, in the cylinder. 
The main reason you want to do that is so that um, oil will sit in those passageways um, in the little cross hatchings and that'll just help seal the rings a little bit better and um, provide better lubrication to the cylinder, thus helping in less wear. Alright guys, so right now we're going to clamp the cylinder in this vise with um, a towel so we don't mar up any of the mating surfaces and we're going to go through proper honing procedures. Alright, let's get to it. Alright guys, so this is going to be the procedure for honing out your cylinder on a four stroke engine, especially. This will only work in this application. So right here I'm doing some Scotch-Brite uh, just to clean up a little bit of that carbon that was left over and then just spray that down. I'm using ATF because it has a lot of cleaning properties to it. A lot of people say that you can clean the cylinder when you're done honing with ATF. I like to just use ATF in the process um, to just help get as much grit out of the cylinder walls as possible and just keep it a real clean process. So right here I'm putting some ATF along the cylinder wall before I start honing and I have a dry stone as you can see. Um, this works this works good. I prefer a flex hone but uh, this will get you by in a pinch. It works just fine. Um, so you're, you're gonna want to go through like about 15 to 20 passes and it's pretty tough with a variable speed drill but uh, just do your best and uh, try to keep a consistent speed going in and out and um, turning speed, rotational speed. And you want to make sure that you keep the drill going as you're pulling the stones out. Keep a consistent cross hatch. And then just a little bit of brake clean and some compressed air to dry it off. And then what we're going to do is I have a little bit of engine oil, 10W40, just basic oil. Uh, and just a really, really thin coating on the inside of the cylinder wall. Um, I just, this is just standard procedure that I always do to help aid in a little bit of corrosion prevention and just keep it nice for those rings to seal up uh, for the initial startup. All right guys, so now we're gonna be installing the rings <clears throat> onto the piston. Take special note to measure the ring end gap when you're installing these. You're basically gonna put the ring in the cylinder, squeeze it in, push it down, put the piston over top, and then measure with a feeler gauge. And that reading, but the feeler gauge should be anywhere in between these tolerances, um, 8 thousandths to 12 thousandths, and 8 thousandths to 28 thousandths for the oil ring, which is gonna be right here. This is gonna be our top compression ring, and we're gonna be looking for 8 thousandths to 12 thousandths, like I said. And take special note with the ring gap orientation, we're gonna be putting the top compression ring. Opening of this compression ring is gonna be facing towards the exhaust side along with the bottom side rail of the oil ring. And then the spacer ring is gonna be facing to the left side of the engine. And then the top rail is gonna be facing the rear of the bike towards the intake side. All right guys, so when it comes to piston ring installation, here's a few mistakes that I've made over the years. Um, bending an oil rail, that's not a good thing, especially when you're installing it. You wanna make sure that you squeeze those rings as tight as possible and you have a full view. Take a look at both sides of the um, piston going into the cylinder and make sure that those rings are not getting hung up or bent because that is not good. Another thing is the piston ring orientation. Now, I used to think that that didn't matter. It does matter, it matters a lot. It matters where those rings are oriented on the piston as far as, especially the oil ring, the oil rail, um, those end gaps. If you position them all in line, you're gonna have excessive oil consumption and that's not a good thing at all. You're gonna have low buy, you're gonna have smoking, um, and even low compression, um, which is never a good thing. So especially like even on this Honda, um, it shows both side rails 180 degrees apart. Um, the end gaps 180 degrees apart with the um, oil ring spacer 90 degrees apart from both end gaps on the rails. Um, and it's huge that the spacer ring um, does not overlap. You need to make sure that they butt up correctly to each other and not overlap because if they're overlapping, you're just gonna have excessive oil consumption, low compression, just a plethora of bad problems. All right, now we're gonna set in our top compression ring. Put the piston over top. Just get it level. 
Now we're gonna measure that end gap with a feeler gauge. We don't want anything less than eight thousandths. We don't want anything more than twelve thousandths. So that's an eight, I can get that in there fairly easy. And let's go, this is, this technique is called a go no go. So you're gonna put in a thirteen thousandths. If it doesn't fit, we know we're good. And I can't get that 13 in there, so we know we're within the range. It's within the clearance, within the tolerance, so it's good to go. And now before we install this piston, we're gonna install one of these circ clips into the piston just to make it a little bit easier for us um, while it's out of the bike. Um, that way we don't have to go through and do two circ clips while we're installing the piston onto the connecting rod. All right, so our end gap clearances are within spec. We're within the tolerances specified by Honda. Now we're gonna go ahead and install this piston on the connecting rod, and then we'll go ahead and throw our cylinder on top after that. Another great point, guys, that I actually learned from my professor was to position the circ clip up and down. You want the opening either facing at the top or at the bottom. You don't want it side to side. The reason why that is, is because you have the up and down motion of the piston and that could cause the circ clip to bend and actually dislodge. It's more of a theory type of thing, but you know, better safe than sorry. I'd rather put it up and down because with that reciprocating motion up and down, it's not gonna cause the circ clip to bend and possibly dislodge itself from the piston and wreak havoc in the motor. So I always just install them and then I'll take a little pick or a flathead, a small flathead and just rotate the circ clip so that it's facing up and down. And just like that guys, our piston is installed. Another quick tip is to not wear any type of rubber gloves because when you're putting on that cylinder, you don't wanna nick the glove and get pieces of nitrile or rubber caught in between that piston and cylinder wall. 
Um, it's a recipe for disaster, so just take the gloves off, just go bare hands. But you guys just saw in that last clip, the piston is in and moving. Just, just ensure and verify that the piston moves freely um, and that you didn't catch any rails or any um, rings or anything like that that, got, that may have gotten bent up in the cylinder. So uh, verify that, and then when you're done, just cover it up like I did here. And that's all there is to it guys. Just go slow, take your time, and remember to always refer to your model specific service manual for proper tips and procedures. Until the next video guys, I will see you then. Peace.